A very warm welcome to all. I'm Dr. Vasavi Acharya, the founder chairperson, Early Child Development Forum, and I'm really happy to have you all on board today for the for the sphere of influence, where we have 90 plus speakers lined up, and we are starting with our first slot with Simran Balani, the convener, for the next two hours. And I hand over to Simran to start. Thank you, Simran. Thank you so much, Dr. Wasavi, and this is Simran Balani, and I'm live from India, and greetings of the day. This is good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to whichever zone you're joining us. A big round of applause to all the speakers who have joined now. It's this early morning, and the ones who are going to join us throughout the day, a very warm welcome, and I'm not going to take much of the time here. I'm just going to take two minutes to present something about ECDF and then we will start hearing our speakers soon. So please allow me a minute to present my screen. Uh, if you could let me present my screen, Indrani. I'm not able to present my screen. I think you're good to go, Simran. No, it's just look. showing me disabled. Okay. You've just started it. I don't know why. Um, I think you can do a verbal one by the time you know we get it correct, because we are you know losing on the time. All right. So what I will do is I will go ahead and park my presentation for a bit, and I will invite our first speaker uh, for the day, and that's Priscilla Candle. Priscilla is specialist in early childhood music. She has developed a music instructional program for preschoolers in the 1970s. And put your hands together and welcome Priscilla. Okay. Shall I go? Are we ready? Yes, we are, Priscilla. Please go ahead. Okay. You know, I did be, well, I began as a music teacher, not only because music is fun, but it uses both sides of the brain. I found that music was developing memory, reasoning, coordination, cooperation, imagination, and I even saw their IQs go up. To keep the children's attention, I created many interactive songs about their interests. Now you can use my songs and your own creative teaching. I learned that children need to hear, repeat, sing, move, and feel the concepts in many ways. Here's a song that I wrote that teaches hello and how are you in different languages. I want you to try it with me in French. Copy what I sing and do. Bonjour, bonjour, sing. Bonjour, bonjour. Et comment allez-vous? Et comment allez-vous? Bonjour, 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 bonjour. Et comment allez-vous? Et comment allez-vous? Do you see how I'm using movement to go along with the words? I do that with Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and so on. If you want to do a curriculum with international themes, this is a CD you'll love. There's a pizza song that talks about foods from many countries. There are also right hand and left hand distinction songs, learning the days of the week and ABC fun. Come springtime, you'll probably be wanting to sing about bees, ants, colorful birds. Here's a CD with songs to act out, move, draw, and have a good fun with a dinosaur song where the kids love to give a great big roar. Holidays need special music. Here, from Valentine's to Christmas, there are songs to move minds and bodies with counting and drawing and dancing fun. There's a song there to learn the months of the year. Now that you know that singing and movement motivates learning concepts, let's help the singing. I recorded 28 nice exercises to copy my singing and keep your ears and voice in tune. 
you will hear me singing things like do re mi re do do mi so mi do do so do so do that's the idea so to get more ideas on how that works go to my youtube channel slash priscilla candell my songs are on itunes and amazon.com or you can email me at priskidssongs at yahoo.com i have music to motivate or calm your class thank you for listening and happy teaching thank you so much priscilla that was so wonderful and I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Can we have a round of applause? And next, I welcome our next speaker, Brooke Gomes. She has conducted young children for the past 10 years in US and Africa. She served as a classroom instructor and grew to be a peaceful leader. A warm welcome and over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. So I want to talk a little bit about multicultural education beyond the classroom. And when I think about multicultural education beyond the classroom, uh, I think about race, ethnicity, and different religions, which is really, really vital for everyone to know because it's gonna bring about benefits like inclusions and it's gonna just give a better understanding of other people from different cultures. And I also want to include that multiculturalism isn't just those three things. It's also about professions. Not all neighborhoods or cities or communities are going to include uh, a diverse um, professional uh, community. And so as little kids, as they're starting to learn and grow and really explore and we think about all the things that they can be whenever they grow, whenever they grow up, it's really important that we expose them to all different types of professions as well as different cultures. Um, we can do that by having them visit uh, different venues, having them interview people who have really cool jobs, like maybe someone is a programmer, or maybe there's a CEO, or maybe there is someone who uh, has a, another artistic type of profession that maybe they don't have in their community. And someone may think, well, you know, that's really easy to kind of get a handle because of the internet and everything. Um, but what I found is with, ch with children is in some communities, because they don't see people within their communities having these professions, they may not aspire to become these things. So it's so, so important to really expose our children to so many things, uh, a lot of positive things uh, when it comes to professions and different cultures so that they then can become more inquisitive and they can um, start asking their own questions and start wanting to have that, they'll start having that drive to start asking more and wanting to know more about the world around them. So just wanted to give some benefits about multiculturalism and how uh, it can expand our learners' minds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And I'm really happy that all the speakers are keeping their time in check. I really, really appreciate that my beeper is still not going out. <laughs> so thanks a lot. And uh, can I please welcome our next speaker, Stephanie Pasco. She's registered early childhood educator in the province of Ontario, Canada. She has been working in the field for five years and I've experience working with children 18 months to 12 years of age. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm extremely nervous, but extremely excited. Um, my topic is parents as collaborators, and I'll be sharing just some things that I've learned about for the through the past five years. So I've learned that collaboration isn't going to happen overnight. It's a process, and it will be something that needs to be built upon. Um, so having engaging and open and honest communication with parents is very, very essential to establishing that collaboration within your program, because that is how you will build long and strong relationships with the parents. And the relationship between a parent and the child is essential and involving the educator in that relationship will help to build even more on that foundation that you're looking for. So I've learned that having, well, recognizing that the child and the parent are the experts on the child themselves, then that will help you get to where you need to go. So being able to communicate openly with the parent 
not holding back, but maintaining that respect for each other is how that collaboration will come about. And making sure as well that the dialogue that is happening between the parent is constantly going on daily, throughout the day, throughout the weeks, that will help parents realize that you are putting forth an effort to have them involved in your program. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And um, parents will be thankful for being able to understand what is going on. And that will then motivate them to want to actually participate in your program because some parents sometimes feel like they're not welcome. So I do find that if you share what you're doing in your program and that if you just make sure that you tell them that you're grateful for their input and their opinion, then that will help them establish the want, the need, the yearning to be part of the early learning of their children. So I do, I have learned rather that making sure that when you are talking with them, that communication, that relationship building, that's how you're going to get your collaboration at the end of the day, which will make your program soar and be so much more fun. So yeah, just communicate is good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks so much and lovely hearing you. A big round of applause. And now I present our young voice, the first young voice for the day, Henry. Henry, who is 17 year old from China, who presently lives in Canada. He was a part of China's Olympic swimming team. He has helped to develop two startups before the age of 15. Woo, wow, a warm welcome, Henry. Sorry, may I uh, present my screen? Ladies and gentlemen, Congratulations, you have been set up for success. All of you, you speak English, the shared language of business, research, and 1.27 billion people around the globe. Now, not everyone is as fortunate, like uh, me, for instance. Well, I grew up in China and I can still clearly remember what learning English is like. It's like a survival show on TV, just man versus nature, except in this case, Nature wins. So this brought me to think, is there an easier way to learn English as a kid to comprehend this question? I dove into a psychology and neurology of young children. Now, from study, we know this to be an accurate description of children's brain. No need to applaud me for the artwork here. In this brain, there's this. And that is the child, him or herself. This is key because children are egocentric or most aware of themselves. This is when I realized learning English or any language for the sake shouldn't be about feeding external content into a kid, but rather an internal process where the children crave to talk about themselves, but find that they can't and hungrily gather the means to, thus as a byproduct, learning the language. To express you need an interaction and you need a listener. Human adults are notoriously bad listener. But you know what's a good listener? Technology. It's programmed to absorb all the inputs and give one predictable response. So at this point, I realized what really needed is technology that's capable of interacting with children. But what should they say? What topic? War and peace? Now, again, children are egocentric. It must be a topic familiar and straightforward. Playground, toys, asking if uh, I can eat lollipop for dinner. Okay, that's for me. Now, we have the means and we have a topic, but what shape should this take? What can appeal to children to engage? Well, we all love story. And it's always been my childhood's dream to be a character in a story. So why don't we build a story with the child as his character? Surely that'll be engaging, immersive. And let's say this as a crazy idea, we make it English. So they learn the language along the way. Now we're getting there. So hence, this is my project, to build a technology that interact and narrates a story with a child in its center, hopefully one at a time, where children from a different linguistic background, the world will once again be open. And thus, before I finish, c'est pas la fin. Para cada idioma que hablas, je y me c'est de belt fer de It's not the end. 
For every language you speak, the more the world opens up to you. Thank you very much. Wow, Henry, superb. This is so, so good. This is superb. You're giving us some real time goals here. Thank you very much, Henry, for your time today. I welcome Somapika Sarkar, the next. She is the Life Skills Educationist, founder of Hooray Kids, an educational venture to promote life skills in the formative years, conducts workshop for parents and teachers on how to educate children on life skills. A warm welcome and over to you. Thank you, Simran. Uh, good morning and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to ECDA for having me here. I'm Somapika Sarkar, and I'm going to talk on social emotional well being of children. Social emotional well being comes from the social emotional skills, which are essential life skills and a must for overall well being of the child. Well, this well being means the state of being happy, healthy, and comfortable. Aristotle, the famous Greek philosopher, said that uh, you know educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. He was so right. Yes, we can educate the heart by including social emotional learning in mainstream education. We can include these skills in our teaching as well as parenting. Let's take one example. Uh, if a child comes to you and uh, he says, my friend fell in the classroom, I rush to him. What does he say about the child? That the child has a high sense of care, feeling, compassion, and empathy for others. Let's take another example. When a child comes to you, comes to you and uh, says that, I did a mistake. I kept a wrong book in the school bag. I'm feeling bad. What does it say about the child? That child have a uh, you know, high sense of self-awareness and emotional awareness too. Well, in these kind of situations, we adults also have to respond positively by saying, yes, uh, it's a wrong book. It's okay to do a mistake. Let's uh, be careful next time. So youth, it's not always academic training, which is important, but it's also the social emotional training, which is equally important. To put this in simple words, the social emotional skills adds life to a person's personality. And this skills lead to social emotional well-being, which also helps the children to deal with the ups and downs of the academic life effectively. After all, everybody is not a topper in a class or exam. Everybody is unique and the social emotional well-being will help to acknowledge and nurture this uniqueness throughout the life. Let me share three simple ways how you can promote this social emotional well-being in kids. First is through storybooks. Of course, whenever you are uh, narrating stories, you'll be talking a lot about the stories and characters, but do talk about the feelings of the character. For example, if it is a rabbit and daughter story, talk about what the tortoise would have, uh, you know, what was tortoise feeling when he uh, realized that he's not able to speed up fast, you know, like rabbit. Or, uh, you know, so these kind of feelings you can, or you should talk throughout. Uh, you can talk about the feelings of the rabbit also. Uh, second, you include uh, soft toys as much as you can in all the learning activities, especially if the children are very young. This automatically adds a lot of, uh, you know, sense of care and love and affection in children. Third is that uh, let the child talk through this phone. I'm not telling them to use apps, but let the child connect to their inner grandparents, friends, cousins, let them talk. That's the easiest ways to connect to uh, people around. And uh, to end it all, uh, to end up by, uh, you know, speak today, I just want to say, let's all work together to promote this well-being in children uh, from the early years of childhood to lay a strong and balanced foundation to their personality. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Somapika. Thanks a lot for your time this morning. And we welcome somebody with a very charming smile, Brian Coulter, an experienced educator in UK and, UK and international schools, trained to deliver both UK and IB curriculum, now focused on teacher training at Sorasa at Pedagogical Transformations. A warm welcome and over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning from Dubai. Good morning, everyone. Some amazing, amazing speeches this morning. Can I share my screen, please? Be able to see it. So training, hiring and retaining qualified teachers. First of all, as a facilitator, um, we understand nowadays that facilitating means that we are supporting. Uh, supporting is important because of course, in the current day, we can Google anything, can't we? Knowledge is what? How are we imparting knowledge? I don't want to start with too many negatives, but training doesn't work. Training does not work. Much research has been done into this, has been looked at, much data has been provided, and training doesn't work. If you're still with me, if you believe me, then I have caught your attention. 
Now, what do I mean by training doesn't work? What I actually mean is two hours of training every three months doesn't work. Bolt-on activities don't work. Training has to be consistent and training has to be owned. Now, we all know that, that teachers and education and the world is going through a bit of a situation just now. And on my screen just now, you can see some of the reasons that, that also contribute, not just at the moment, but all the way through education, we have faced things like lack of opportunity, lack of motivation, future ready training programs, lack of prestige. And I'm really interested to know how teachers are viewed across the world. And I was interested to read recently that actually in Russia, teachers are most respected or equated to that job role of a doctor um, or something of that prestige. So there are many reasons as to why we can be um, lose motivation, let's say, in teaching and education and percentages of new teachers leaving education in the first three years are quite alarming. So what do I consider important in all this in terms of training, in terms of maintenance? Pedagogy through joint respect. And that can only really come through ownership. If we're not owning our pedagogical practice, if we're not aware of it, if we don't have the opportunity in the moment to react, as teachers, as facilitators, as educators, we are constantly reacting to situations. And if we cannot react ourselves, it's one thing recalling data and analyzing data, but how do we grow ourselves? Of course, the crude truth is salary growth is, is important. And of course, while we don't all necessarily need premium jobs, we want attractive jobs, do we not? So within attractiveness of education, training and maintaining, we would consider, and, and at Sarasa, what we have considered and put together is an opportunity for training and to own your training, to maintain your training and to do it in an AI and life um, opportunity. <coughs> the first alarm. <laughs> so this is how we do it. And this is what we say to everyone today. Own your pedagogy, own your training, own your opportunity. And, and using AI and a balance of what you're doing in the classroom is what we do at Sarasa and what we would like to invite you all to do. If you're interested in speaking about this in any more depth at all, I would love to converse. With the alarm gone, I'm going to run now. Thank you so much, Brian. And yes, my alarm did go on finally. Thank you so much. And I uh, really, really appreciate your time this morning. And may I now invite our next speaker, Akshita Shetty. Akshita Shetty, Brian, would you kindly uh, stop the screen share? Akshita Shetty is child rights worker with a history of working in the space of children and education for more than 15 years. Work with organizations like the Concern for Working Children and N4. And I want warmly welcome you over to you. Akshita. Do we have Akshita? Akshika was there. Yeah, she did yeah, because Akshika. she just couldn't come back to me. Yes, yes. We will okay. just give her a second. So it's been very interesting so far to listen. Everybody, you know, talking on different topics and all different perspectives and like it's it's I think this first half an hour has been really enriching already and we have this full seven and a half hours more to go and um, Akshika if you are there you can start your uh, presentation or we can wait for you and probably uh, invite, she's trying uh, to get in uh, she just sent me a message she's trying to okay. get in could you let her in please sure sure we are looking into it Waiting or Simran, we are uh, we are working on that. So probably you can invite uh, Reshma Shah. Uh, okay, Reshma Shah, one minute. I think Archana is ready for with her presentation. So let yeah, me sure. get Archana yes. first, and then we will take Reshma Shah, please. Archana, yes. over to you, dear. And let me just let me just introduce you. So please warm welcome. Please warmly welcome Archana Madhusudan. She is a language skills specialist an educator in the street for more than two decades, neuroscience practitioner. Over to you, Archana. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Balani. Greetings of the day, ladies and gentlemen, educators and parents who have joined us on this lovely morning. 
I would like to talk about emotional and social, uh, social and emotional intelligence. Now here I'm not talking from the perspective of students. So learning is not necessary that it is uh, restricted to students. I am speaking from the perspective of social and emotional intelligence for educators and parents. If you see the representation of eggs, emotions are as delicate as eggs, right? So let's see how they impact. This is a scenario which generally happens in classrooms. If you look at the picture here, we see the child who is being reprimanded or taken to task for whatever reason shows guilt, shame. There's another child in a violet uh, blazer and uh, she is nonchalant about it, at least bothered. Look at the one in the white t-shirt. She looks horrified. Why is it that different children react differently to the same situation, right? That is because children can be broadly understood like an orchid or a dandelion. Now this is from the perspective. What are orchids and what are dandelions? Orchids are very delicate, beautiful flowers, need to be nurtured and taken care of in that protected environment to blossom to the most beautiful form they can take. Whereas dandelions are hardy plants and hardy flowers. They can just grow in anywhere. Children also are like this. Some of them are very sensitive, others are resilient. As an educator, as a parent, we need to understand what type of a child are we handling? Only then we will be able to meet the emotional needs of the child. For this, we need to first co-regulate ourselves. Generally what happens is sometimes we just go off the handle depending on how a child is non-responsive or is non-reactive to everything. And we may use harsh words or we may try to you know, say to the child, why don't you understand what's wrong with you? How many times do I explain? the children. So what we are doing here is we are just creating that learned helplessness in a child. Children just develop the attitude of why bother? They're not going to listen. Or, I can't do it. Come on. What's the point? Or what's the use? They're anyway not going to recognize my work. That will never work. Once the child gets into this mode, it is very difficult to get the child back. Let me give you a classic example. How do Mahouts train elephants? When the elephant, uh, when it's a calf, they tie a chain around the leg of the elephant, baby, and tie it to a log. The child tries very hard to free himself, but he's unable to because of the limited strength he has. But this just goes on and on for years together. And even when the elephant is a full grown adult elephant and has more than 100 times the strength that he had as a baby, you just tie a small thread and put him onto the log. He simply has the learned helplessness of, oh, come on, I am chained, I cannot move. This is what we are doing to our children if we are restricting them. We need to understand their emotional needs and accordingly model ourselves. Positive reinforcements are something we can try rather than trying to put down a child. And a teacher is definitely, teacher and a parent also role model for the child. This is called the Pygmalion effect. If the teacher reinforces the child as, yes, you're good, you can do it. Focus on the strengths of the child rather than the weaknesses of the child. The child simply feels, my teacher says I will pass and he will do it. Because people are influenced by ex expectations built upon them. We as parents and educators need to unlearn the learned paralysis because we've been in the belief system of rewards and punishment to train a child. So I think unlearning the learned paralysis, considering challenging kids needs punishment, spare the, child, spare the rod and spoil the child is what we've learned. That doesn't work in today's change scenario. So challenging kids need love, right? So, Educators, parents, if you want to know more about how to develop your emotional quotient, connect with me on all of these channels. Thank you so much, Sphere of Influence, for given, having given me this opportunity. Thank you, everybody. That was just wow, Archana, and you touched a very delicate topic. Thank you very, very much. And a lot of, lot of audience will be able to relate this with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I welcome next uh, speaker, Rishma Shah. 
an educationist with more than 20 years of experience, founder of an education NGO that provides affordable education and runs an award-winning budget free school in suburbs of Guwahati. Over to you, Reshma. Are you there? Yes, I'm here, Simran. All right, great. Over uh, to you. So good morning to everyone and my co-educators in this field. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my topic is um, how to retain, get teachers to continue with us in our journey of nurturing young children. Uh, the first thing that I think we need to recognize is that facilitators or teachers are human beings. We must, as uh, you know, those who direct the course of education, we must appreciate that first and understand they also have certain aspirations and try to match that with the vision of our institute. Now, there are some factors which uh, decide how a teacher conducts herself in the school, what she sees for herself in the preschool, especially in this stage. And I know many of us have this uh, issue that sometimes we get someone who's really good, but for some reason, they are not with us for a long period of time. And that creates problems for us. So my suggestion is, let us understand the factors that contribute to creating a team that works together. And once we understand that, let us also redefine our expectations and our understanding of the role of teachers and facilitators. The word that I would like to use here is nurturer. And it is not just us who should think as nurturers. The person who greets the child as they walk in through the gate, the person who handles the child when they take escort them to the washroom, the person who teaches them the social skills should see themselves as the nurturer. You know, this nomenclature that we use, this is significant because if I call myself a teacher, then I teach. If I call myself a facilitator, then I am simply facilitating. But if I call myself a nurturer, then my response to the child will also be like that of a nurturer. And that is where the experience of the child is going to have a significant impact because then I will not get irritated by them. I will look at my role as a more complete one. I will take on more responsibility to fulfill my mission of nurturing the child and to keep continuing to do what I am doing, to build that team together. I must understand that sometimes it's not just better pay. Sometimes it is not just good facilities. Sometimes it is not just what we do uh, how we uh, train them, because functional skills is something we can all train them in, how to make a lesson plan, how to discipline the child, but to connect with the child, like the speakers have mentioned before me, the emotional connect can come only when we think of ourselves as nurturers. And I am telling you this because I face this every day. I have very young girls who come in very eager to teach, but there are many distractions on the way. They don't look at it as a career path. There is pressure from home and outside to leave and go for more lucrative jobs. And they don't see the value that they bring into the class. So my suggestion is let each nurturer know that they are fulfilling a unique role in this preschool, in this early stage. They are the role models for the children they interact with. And they must understand that themselves. Because what happens is if they're only looking at it as a paycheck, if they're only looking at it as a responsibility that is given to them, you teach this class. Today you do only vowels. Today you teach them about nature. Then they are just going to be a mechanical person who's just getting things done. And that's not how we are going to get our early childhood educators to flourish in their roles. So to retain them and to create that environment, those who lead these institutes, those who are the ones responsible for sharing the vision of these institutes, they need to 
understand that first. First, recognize that they are also human beings. They have aspirations. They have bad days as well. We must remember that because we are dealing with children. And if I have a bad day and I have to deal with 40 children at a time, I need some support from my colleagues as well. So this is what I have to share with you. And uh, please, uh, thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, this is my suggestion. So let's look at each one of us as a team of nurturers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reshma. Thanks a lot for explaining it so calmly and beautifully to us. And I really, really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much. And once again, I want to pause here and say, brilliant job, great work, everyone for presenting your points this morning. And now I welcome Ashika Shetty. Once again, we sorry couldn't welcome her correctly uh, last time because of her technical glitch. A child rights worker with a history of working in the space of children and education for more than 15 years. Worked with organizations like the Concern for Working Children and, and Poor. Presently, the member of CWC2 for Girls Bangalore Urban. A warm welcome, Ashika, over to you. Thank you so much for that, Simran, and good morning to all. I'm very humbled to be part of this panel of uh, August speakers and educators. Um, my perspective with regard, or the topic that was given to me is child rights and protection. Uh, something that is very sensitive, something that everybody wants to do and be part of especially caring adults like all of us here on the panel. Now, uh, when we talk about child rights, the one particular right that I think a lot of us seem to gloss over or may not completely understand is the right to a child's uh, voice. Now, when we talk about children's voice, we always consider them in the form of a feedback or understanding whether they liked something or did not like something but we have not or we struggle to explore how we can involve children in actually all matters that affect their life, be it education, be it uh, their personal life and anything that affects them uh, to give them an all round uh, perspective. And in the school setup, which is what we're trying to uh, talk about here, how do we incorporate or understand or imbibe a child's voice uh, is uh, a very interesting concept called as children's committees. Now, a lot of schools uh, do form these kind of groups for children uh, where children are uh, sharing what they, they want and they need. But these are all being uh, spearheaded or supported by adult intervention. Now, when we adults intervene, there is a possibility for us to kind of uh, uh, preempt what a child needs, uh, speak for the child, and at many a times uh, redirect the entire conversation in such a way that we, in a manner that we adults think should happen. Now, um, if you look at the UNCRC and how it is also beautifully, very uh, nicely interpreted in India in the juvenile justice system, it talks about how uh, a child has to be spoken in a language that is appropriate to them, which is um, age specific and to gather their inputs on creating, ideating, and implementing any kind of interventions within school scenarios. Now, a little more about Children Committee. It is the core of child participation, uh, a concept that I deeply and intrinsically endorse and believe. If one has witnessed it, I am sure you will agree with me on how powerful Children's Committee can be to ensure the rights of children are upheld. Now, Children's Committee gives children the agency to exercise their right to be heard with consent, respect, and uh, respect for their rights to autonomy. These are things that we need to anyway imbibe when it comes to protection. Now, when we talk about protection, how does a child understand that there are boundaries being crossed? We need to explain them concepts of consent and respect, which comes when they are taking ownership for something that is affecting their life. Now, a lot of times we see that adults like taking the whole role of being a savior, a protector, a solution provider. But we don't understand that's not what children are looking for. They're looking for somebody to listen to us, to understand what, where they are coming from, understand their perspective of their problem. Uh, we often see that the efforts to understand children's voices end up with children themselves having to express their ideas in, in, in difficult uh, circumstances. And others find it very easy to kind of make these decisions for them from their own perspective. 
So therefore, what I feel is that working with children, if you don't believe and enjoy that uh, children have a right to whatever is affecting their lives, uh, any intervention, be it education, be it uh, life skill, be it uh, social uh, uh, support, or be it emotional support, will fail if we do not incorporate their uh, ideas and their inputs as well. Now, we also need to understand that children have as much rights as we do, actually even more. And that needs to be uh, preserved. Now, opportunities to explore uh, and involve children are many. However, it's the mindset of the adults in these spaces that needs to be re-looked at. Learning of life skills is best when children get opportunity to experience it. Critical thinking, crisis management, decision making can be best experienced through child's participation. And this can be ensured by these children committees that schools can actually uh, make use of. Now, creating a platform for children to effectively exercise their rights to take decisions through children committee is the duty and responsibility of us adults. Uh, I also feel that we adults have a lot of work in our hands to do, to understand our obligations to the children, understand how we need to be uh, facilitators and not teachers, because children have the innate ability to learn. They have learned to uh, cry, they have learned to sit, they've learned to stand, they've learned to walk. Now, when we just facilitate their learning, that's when it's going to be more empowering and uh, also enables children to be independent and uh, empowered, uh, responsible adults. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ashika, for expressing your thoughts this morning. Thanks a lot for your time once again. And now I invite one more young voice amongst us. His name is Anveshnan Gar. He's a student of class nine, Marius Public School, Gohati. Multiple award winner, multiple interests, Takkan Vodo and literature, etc. participated in Katha Literacy Workshop. And a warm welcome to you. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll um, start by sharing my screen. Yeah, I can. I hope can see it. Yeah, I can hear you a little feeble if you can speak a little louder, please. Um, sure. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm Anvishan Gag. I'm a ninth grade student and from Marius Public School. I live in the Northeast Indian state of Assam. The topic I've chosen is learning during pandemic times. So, what does learning mean? Well, in this case, learning is the process of gathering knowledge in all aspects of the world and not merely through education. So what did we learn during this pandemic time? Um, studying at home allowed us to self-reflect and look at the world from a different perspective instead of looking at it like a challenge that we'll have to pass. We got to look at it like a complex system that, while not perfect, manages to solve the various problems that get thrown its way. Of course, this adverse situation has made us learn a lot of things. One such thing is that we can be united when the situation demands, when something alien to us tries to hamper our normal daily routine. I have realized that we must follow all protocols, not only to save myself from this rare disease, but also to save others. I realized that family is the most important thing in the world and we must do everything in our power to stay close to each other and six feet apart from everyone else. Staying at home has led us to realizing the importance of peers and how they help us in the learning process. Without their support, learning appears to be a much more tedious affair. The rapid switch of everything from the conventional modes to online media has given us a taste of the future and pre prepared us for it. The COVID-19 pandemic has hampered our lives in many ways. With education institutions closed down, the government has been encouraging online education to maintain the academic continuity. There are many ways regarding online education. The drawbacks include attention span. For students prone to procrastination, online education can be difficult to coordinate and to remain motivated also becomes an effort. Social interaction. Most students miss the interactive classes and can't perform well. Even though these problems are unavoidable, the positive side of online education more than makes up for this. Speaking of positive points, firstly, we have convenience. A major advantage of online education is the convenience of it all. With students accessing the internet anywhere and everywhere, so too can they access their classes, often from the comfort of their own home. Availability and affordability. With online courses, the opportunities available to students are boundless. 
Pairing this with the money saved by students on commute and housing, the online education system seems like the perfect solution. Now to look at this situation from a different angle, we can clearly see that even though this disease has adversely affected all the man-made systems, it has replenished most of the natural processes. Many wild animals can be seen roaming to streets even now as they have reclaimed their lost space. I would hereby like to conclude my speech by saying that even though this pandemic has created numerous problems, there also have been some undeniable advantages. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it is so inspiring when we hear these young voices expressing so much. Thanks a lot. And I now open the forum for any question and answers that one might have with the speakers or you want to express your compliments. And I open the forum for two minutes. Um, if, you, if you want to ask something, if you want to comment something, uh, the forum is all yours. Okay, so till we recollect our thoughts, we would want to take a minute to talk a little bit about who we are, what we do as ECW, ECDF, ECDF. So I will take a minute and share my screen. All right, I hope this is visible. A little bit about knowing us, who we are. And so ECDF has been uh, fundamentally doing a lot of important work in the lives of early childhood education. Let's look into it, what we are doing. How do we do it? We are going through us, even though we had a pandemic time, we did not stop there. We have been doing campaigns, we have been doing seminars, teacher trainings, workshops, leadership programs. So we are, what I like to say is we are walking the talk, all right? And here is more glimpses of what we do. So this is how the foundation looks like. We have zonal head in India on the Northeast section, which is Reshma. Of course, at the center and the heart of it, we have Dr. Vasavi, uh, who is inspiring us all each day. And that's me. We have Dr. Sue, Dr. Catherine. And here we are looking at West India zonal member Amrit Nakpal, Sana Fatima uh, from UAE. And uh, let's look. We have from North India, Sonia. We have Gulai Singul Yamur from Istanbul. And these are some glimpses of some of the events that we have been doing. Uh, in teacher training program, in early childhood national conferences. We have been doing kids carnivals. We have been doing global conclaves. And there is more parent enrichment programs, certificate courses. And there is something very exciting, which is coming up, which is Earth Literacy Awards. And we have internal international webinars. We have Pinnacle Awards. And this is something which is very close to the heart of Dr. Vasavi and the entire team, ECDF's project, Naba Udev. And we are going to do the round two of similar projects. Here are some of the pictures that we want to share with you. And here is an invite of how you can make a difference. If you're already not a member, you can reach out to any of our zonal heads or here are the contact details for you to contact us and become a member and make a difference. And of course, this is uh, who all we are gathered today, uh, which uh, you have been seeing uh, quite on the social media. And our proud uh, support partners today are Tender Petals, Book Bells, Inner Eye Foundation, SSU, uh, VASSU Talent Search, and yes, here is, here is some of the information for becoming a member. I know I'm standing in between uh, the audience and the next speaker, so I'm not going to read out fully, but this is for you to um, look into and do make a difference by becoming a member and join our organization. Thank you very much for listening to me. And now I will stop share and I'll invite uh, my next speaker, which is uh, one second. Carrie Sutton, 
uh, from Australia. She's an educator. She's an author. Over to you, Carrie. Thank you, Simran. And I am just going to share my screen. So we'll go there. Share. And can everybody see it? Can you see, can you hear me, Simran? Yes, yes, yes. It's visible. Well That's all right. I just wanted to make sure because I thought I wasn't sure if I clicked it. Um, so my topic this afternoon is supporting children's social emotional competence. And one of the things uh, I guess, and I'm so honoured to be able to speak at the ECDF uh, sphere of influence today, because this is one of my passions. I believe that children around the world, unfortunately, at the moment, are uh, there's a lot of depression, anxiety and self-harm that we're seeing in some countries. And part of it is because they don't have the social and emotional competence to actually deal with the feelings they have. So that's why I chose this topic particularly today. One of the things I guess for me, which is the most valid point is that as the previous speakers and even as Ashwaran was talking about, uh, we have a gift as early childhood educators. And that is that we shape the lives of these children for the future. It is us as nurturers, it's us as carers, whether it be parents, early childhood educators, an extended family member, these are the sorts of things that we actually, um, we shape their lives. And that's why I'm looking at giving the tools and skills today for that. So the reason I'm talking about it is because we are the role models. And unless we do these things, children won't understand their feelings. The first one, and there's three things I'd like to cover. The first one is that we listen with full attention and empathize with children. Even as young as two and three, we can say, hey, if they start crying or if they look at different things and they're expressing um, because behavior expresses emotions and we can say, hey, I see you're really angry that somebody took the shovel off you in the sandpit or that they left you out of playing. So we take the time, we stop, we look at them, we get down to their level and we listen with full attention because that helps the children Uh, we can't hear you, Carrie. Carrie, we can't hear you. That's all right. Is there? You can hear me now? Yes, great. Excellent, cool. Um, so they, uh, that what I was saying was we actually really need to understand, we need to get down at their level, we need to look in their eyes and empathize with them. I can see that you're really um, having a hard time. And it, then we actually talk about their emotions and feelings and describe that and say, you know, um, what can I help you with? It looks like you're angry. I can see your face. It looks like you're having a really great time. It, look like, it looks like you might be confused because sometimes children don't understand the feelings they're going through. They're only little people. They haven't actually had all the experience that we have as, had as adults. And what we get to do and what we start talking about is giving them the language, allowing them to express, this is how I feel. It looks like you feel that way. It looks like you feel upset. It looks like you feel angry. It looks like you feel, and, and it, I can understand that you might be frustrated or tired. And those are the sorts of things when we talk about and give them the understanding that they've got, we then can say, when you're feeling angry, it's not okay to punch somebody just because they took your shovel, just because they did that, it's not okay to push them over or to bite them. We then help them develop coping strategies. So it would be those three things. If I could leave you with anything, it would be that we listen as people who are caring for the children's social emotional competence, listen and empathize, talk about emotions and feelings and make them all emotions and feelings are okay. They're simply data. It's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to punch somebody and then help teach our children coping strategies. And I'd like to thank you all for being here because taking time out of your precious day uh, is one, one thing, but ECDF, thank you also for having me. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you so much and uh, thanks for keeping the time limit in mind and explaining what you had to and making your point clear. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. I would want to take a minute here in case if somebody wants to 
ask any questions. We, we do are doing very good with the time. Um, so we, we can take some transition time, but if not, then we have Tulika Samal next. She has over 15 years of experience as an educator in varied roles, but that includes, but not limited to principal of a residential school, vice principal, headmistress, and junior high math teacher at Phoenix, Arizona, US, and she's co-founder of Edoxic. Over to you, Tulika. Thank you so much, Simran. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everyone, yes, just to make sure. Very nice. All right. So uh, uh, we are here in such a global event where everyone has their own point of view, and I'll be sharing uh, what I feel about uh, the topic that I chose, which is about conscious and effective parenting. I mean, we all are entrepreneurs, we are moms, we are parents, whether or not we have our own kid, but we have at certain point had the experience of handling kids, whether in the classroom or at home or niece and nephew. So uh, I'm gonna talk more about, uh, you know, what conscious and effective parenting is rather than talking more about parenting. So it's really essential that no matter what parenting style uh, you belong to or you follow to, it's really essential that we, uh, you know, focus more on what we are and what we uh, set an example as because when we talk about conscious and effective parenting, it's really essential that we are role models. And so I'll be talking about a few points that as a parent, as an educator, we can keep in mind when building relationship or you know, uh, parenting our kids. The very first factor is the time. It's really essential to uh, spend some quality time with our kids, not just sitting with them doing their homework or just during the meal time, eating together, but quality time where you are actually having conversation with your kid where he or she is sharing what happened or how did they spend their whole day or maybe spending time outside in the park playing with them. So something where you are actually involved with your kid, it's all about the kid and not the way you want to spend time with your kid, taking them to the mall, maybe it doesn't impress them. So quality time is really uh, an important factor. The second factor is modeling behavior. Children are going to be you know, they will learn from what you are and they are not what you want to teach them because they are great observers. They are watching you. They are imitating you. They are looking the way you speak, the way you talk, the language you use. So it's really essential that we are very aware and conscious about the language that you're using, the tone you are using. Because if you are not modeling certain behavior, but you're expecting them to do the uh, behavior in a certain way, uh, it's kind of like a dilemma for them because they are unable to know what is right and what is wrong. Because for them, you are asking them to do certain things that you yourself are not following. And last but not, not the least, uh, positive reinforcement. Sometimes we don't spend enough time, you know, um, we are always pinpointing the mistake, but then we are not aware of the positive thing that the kid might be doing. So it's really essential to find opportunity to praise them to make sure that you know, we are also looking at the positive things. And last, loving and peaceful environment. You know, kids love to be loved, affectionate, and they are born with good intention. So it's really essential that we take care of all this, and this is what conscious and effective parenting is, and it will you know, make the child uh, is, uh, confident and will definitely have high self-esteem. And so at the end, I'm going to just wrap up by saying, uh, extending my time to VCDF and everyone here who has organized, and it's great to be here. I hope I did not pass the time. <laughs> no, you were perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for extending your thoughts to us, and thanks for your time this morning. And we move on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Karthik Naidu. Um, are you here? And he's founder of White Petals Chain of Schools. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Vaspi and ECDF. Uh, it's been amazing. And the topic I'll be covering today is going to be about the future proofing. Okay, future proofing of the child. This was one of the most uh, exciting topics uh, to be speaking about. So let me set the context right. What is future proofing? Future proofing is very simple. It's about preparing the children for the future with the time ahead. It's about planning how the world is going to change 
and preparing them today so that they can meet the needs of the entire world that is going to be created after 10 years. The first thing I want to share is a lot of people think that the world is evolving right now. The world is going towards and all of that. I want to change the context here by entire thing. The first thing is the world is not evolving. People are changing the world. How do I say that? I can tell you very clearly because if you look at the, this this is the one of the most powerful theories I'm going to share, share today with uh, all the members who are watching this. Right now, the world is moving the thoughts, actions taken by the top five leaders around the world. Okay, I can start from Tesla when we are talking about Elon Musk. If he's thinking about colonizing Mars, there is a vision of that person which the world is going to change through. If we talk about Amazon, Jeff Bezos, he changed the entire retail sector. When we talk about Steve Jobs, he changed the technology. Microsoft, you speak about Ambani, Mukesh Ambani right now. He's focusing on how to change the education in India, how to change the technology, that's the internet era. And the third one, he's focusing on solar. So right now, as an educationist, I strongly believe that we need to look at these top five leaders and see what they are thinking about. Because what they are thinking and what they're moving towards is going to be the future of the world. Okay, so I'm going to take you into my presentation right now. I have a small presentation. I know that time is like super constrained here, but still I've kept it very, very short. The first one is what could be the three qualities of a future proofing in a child? The first one is the children must be thinkers. They must think critical thinking thinking about future, visualization, stories. This can get something, uh, this can activate the thinkers within them. The second one is the children must be dreamers. They got to dream fantasy things, whether they read a Harry Potter or they watch movies or fantasy, that is very much required because every dream can be realized later. And the third one is they must be action takers. It means nothing if you know something and don't implement is equal to not knowing. So we got to get these three things in a child to do it. And to do this, we have three people who can leave a good impact on that. First is role of a school. A school plays a major role when it comes actually to the implementation of this. The first one is going to be creating future atmosphere within the school environment. We got to create workshops. We got to create garages. This is something that will give the atmosphere to the child to think about the future in any way, whether it's technology, whether it's automobile or anything. The world is moving towards electrical right now, from automobile to petrol to diesel to electrical. There is an evolution that's happening. So we got to create some spaces within our schools so that we can make sure that they have an atmosphere of that. The second one is creating leaders. Who is a leader? A leader is a person who walks the talk. You got to face it from the front. You got to protect your tribe. So you got to be that kind of a leader. So every leadership quality, the school involves a major part to get that quality in the child. Third is about the most important, which I do currently. And I highly recommend all the educationists, parents, and the young, uh, young students are looking at this, that building communities. Please make a note of this. Just type communities in the comment box, wherever you're watching this. Communities is going to be interest-based. That can be art, that can be technology, that can be anything, but make sure you have smaller communities within your organization dealing with different things so that you can have people to move forward. That's the role of a school. The second one is going to be role of a parent. Role of a parent, first thing is relationship of values. Though the world is going to move towards robots and all of that, but let me tell you something, the only thing that can differentiate a robot and us is going to be the values of relationship. So the relationship value in a child is most important and nobody better than parents are going to be doing that. So we want all the parents to make sure that they put in this element in the child to make them future proof ready. And third, the second is going to be reading habit. Though this might sound traditional, the world is moving towards visual, video, everything. But let me tell you something, reading can change people's life. And for me, it's a, it's a big impact. The day I started reading, things changed for me. So I think this particular habit, not only with the curriculum, but the, apart from that, a reading habit is very important uh, for a parent to inculcate in the child. The third is going to be dedicated workplace at home. This is something that really excites me when I listen to my nephew who stays uh, in Canada currently. He says that I'm going to go to my workplace and start working. Okay, so this is something that was like, wow. I mean, he's going for a dedicated workplace to a dedicated place and he does his work. It means a lot, right? So that's about the parent. And third and the last one is going to be role of educationist. It's going to be you and me. So what are we doing here? 
well, how can we actually implement this to make our children future proof ready in the next 10 years 20 years and 30 years world is not evolving world is being changed by people like you and me what do we do to that the three pointers i want to give you is we got to think ahead of the time if you're right now teaching the children the best part is we are not training them for the current world we're training them after 10 years after 20 years so we got to think about getting those things right now second one is creating visualization of the future You've got to tell students and the children saying that this is how the future could look like 2030, 2040, 2050. When you start giving that visualization to the children in every form of what was the history and what is the future, there is always a responsibility comes within a child that I got to change this. But if we do not get that responsibility in a child, the child will not take a responsibility to change it and they become one among the exact crowd who are going forward and getting into a job or other things. They, we need leaders to change the world. And the third one is awareness of the future. As I told you, the top five leaders in this entire world should be listed down by every educationist and think about where we can place our students in our organization in the future. It could be technology, it could be art, it could be any other field. We need to make sure that we contribute and prepare them right from the younger age. And that's why I'm here in this education industry. I'm the founder, chairman of White Petals Chain of Schools, but I'm here, I'm a lawyer. But I'm here is because to make and give them a platform being here. Jim Ron tells one thing before I wind up, it's about your atmosphere is stronger than your willpower. So creating atmosphere is the primary source of all the educationists and that's our duty to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karthik. And uh, thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. I like the reading habit part. It's very important. Thanks a lot for sharing that Thank again. And I now welcome Abigail Carr. She's specializing in teaching young children, training early years teachers and managing schools and uh, settings for children age six years and under. Over to you, Abigail. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good morning. Good afternoon. Um, and Shin Yen Kwai Le, Sun In Fai Lok, Kung Ai Fat Choi. It's New, New Year's Day here in Hong Kong. So um, I'm really honored to be here on this special day for Hong Kong. And uh, thank you very much for hosting me. I'm just going to share my screen. Larger for you. So wonderful childhoods. How do we unleash the imagination through storytelling? Well, mystery creates wonder and wonder is the basis of man's desire to understand. It's a sense of wonder, of questioning, of wanting to find out that creates scientists, explorers, artists and writers, mathematicians and engineers. And imagination is the source of all human achievement after all. We know as educators, as parents, as anyone that has ever seen a child at the beach or on the grass or even in the kitchen, that they will grab or get into anything and everything that ignites their curiosity. And, and what ignites their curiosity is almost everything, if not absolutely everything. They'll ask question after question to gain deeper insight into something, you know, the why stage. We may all agree that in childhood, a sense of wonder is innate. Then something happens as we grow older, where the mundanity of life takes us away from regular or struck moments and brings us into a world where things kind of pass us by um, and without a second thought sometimes. But just for a second now, cast your mind to a time in your adult life that you've been awestruck. Maybe it was a piece of art, a photo or a place you visited and hold that thought and those feelings in your mind to capture again what a child feels or what a baby feels as they explore their world with eyes wide open and, and taking everything in for the first time. So how do we create moments that foster long-term wonder and don't bring children into our own mundane routines where awe is something we experience few and far between? There are some amazing speakers here today sharing their thoughts and in my own very short time, I put to you not in itself something tangible, not toys or a special expensive resource setup, but words, specifically in the form of storytelling. Books, of course, they can give us a sense of wonder and enjoyment, but storytelling is special. It paints a picture verbally that a child or anyone listening can imagine for themselves and inspires others to do the same. 
bringing an awareness to the subconscious to dig deep for our ideas and thoughts and creative thinking that can unleash the imagination. Whether it be fiction. Did you know that a Hong Kong nature princess lives in this castle with turrets and it's just behind my house. She looks out over the land, surveying the tall buildings towering in the distance over the trees. And that native banyan tree that holds up the bridge, it houses magical creatures, each with a power that helps all the Hong Kong animals to have, live happily in the forest. What do you think the princess and the magical creatures do to help the animals? Or be it closer to fact. Sorry. This may look like any other box to you, but I tell you that this box was born in England, thousands of miles away from Hong Kong. It always knew it had an important job to do, a job that would take it over seas and mountains to bring a gift to a special person one day. It made sure that the people helping it to make it used good and sturdy cardboard so that it would be strong enough to withstand the journey. And this box was made so strong and believes itself to be so useful that it simply must be used again and again and again. What can we use it for? Storytelling is a free and flexible resource. Used wisely, we can instill values and traditions for the world of a child that brings wonder and curiosity naturally through words and thoughts and ideas. I absolutely love to support parents and educators in their own context, enhance early learning and instill a love of sustainability and the natural world in children. Thank you very much. Thanks Abigail for taking us through this imaginary world. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thanks Thank a lot. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, can I please welcome our next speaker, Solin Kaur, a youth personality development coach and an educator who has worked with reputed schools, author of Good Vibes Make Good Lives, and a motivational public speaker. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ECDF, for giving me such a beautiful platform amongst the stalwarts here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Before I start my topic, the conscious and effective parenting. Imagine that your four years old is alone in the room and has just gotten hold of the scissors and decide to cut her hair while playing the barber shop. You've just entered to see the worst nightmare, I tell you, what your reactions will be. You'll shout at the top of your voice, bewildered by the thought that you're not a good parent, either you will curse yourself or your child. That's a big no-no. Instead of reacting in rage of horror, deep breathe, take a moment and relocate yourself. Reflect on your thought and for the time, let go anger. Set boundaries and finally accept what you couldn't alter. I strongly believe children are their own unique class who can teach a parent as well written. It is only a child who makes a person a conscious parent, which lets go of the parent's ego, desires and attachments. Before the arrival of the child to be a parent, will read endless stacks of parenting books. Believe you me, they will. Will listen to thousands of advices and then promise themselves that they would do the opposite of what every parent do, does to shine. But suddenly, everything changes after the arrival of the little bundle of joy. Conscious parenting, as psychologists use this term, describes a style of parenting that usually focuses more on the parent and how mindfulness can try parenting choices. A combination of, I must say, an Eastern philosophy and Western psychology, a blend of meditation and self-reflection. Shafali Sabari, PhD, a New York-based clinical psychologist, author and speaker, says that through serious consideration of cultural legacies, or to put it more bluntly, family baggage and personal conditioning, parents can begin to let go of their own checklist for how, how the life should be. When this occurs, children become free to develop their true identity, which further saves them from identity crisis. We need to be empathetic enough to understand that parenting is a relationship, an interpersonal relationship, not a one-way road. 
instead of forcing behaviors on children, parents need to exercise and regulate their own expectations. Parenting does not mean making a child happy, but to grow and develop with the child simultaneously. There should be no word as ego in parenting, acceptability and adaptability. It is not about fixing up a momentary problem, but it is important to go deep into the process and what it means as a bigger picture. Fill in the hearts and minds of your children with acceptance, understanding, and confidence. For this, I need to give three tips to you today. Check your language. It's utmost important. Is it harsh? Is it sarcastic? Cruel? Degrading? Insensitive? Let's come to the opposite of it. Let's reverse the language. Let's go opposite. Let's use antonyms rather than using harsh, make it sweet. Second is check your self-regulation. It is important the manner you are communicating your child with. You have to be calm, you have to be confident because you are either on passing the legacy to the child. A child is a well. Whatever you put into it, it echoes back. So what you sow, you reap. So it's better that you make a check on being calm and confident. And last but not the least, check your expectations. Quite important. It's a request to, you know, it, it, you must see how developmentally appropriate it is. What kind of a baggage are we putting on a child? Is it that important? Or can we let a child bloom, nourish, and flourish in its own capacity by not doing that helicopter parenting, but being with them, growing with them, and simultaneously moving with them. Thank you so much. Thank you for being, uh, thanks for calling me and hosting me. It was wonderful to be a part of this forum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Swarleen. And these are some good points, especially for the parents. Uh, sometimes we forget that these forums are just not for educators, but they are for parents also. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And I now welcome our youngest voice, Ifat Ikram. Are you here? She's a 15-year-old student from Marius Public School, Gohati, uh, author of Love Alley, founder of Flimur, an organization connecting the youth of today with subjects like mental health and equality, content writer at Girl Up Our Story, a young writer and enthusiast trying to make the world more inclusive and fair with her initiatives and work. Wow, awesome. Over to you, Ifat. Thank you so much for the introduction. So, hello everyone. I'm here. One second. Can you can you just speak up a little louder, please? Yeah, sure. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Mifa Tikram. I'm here to speak on child rights and protection. So, children are the future of our nations, or so we've been learning, right? We have many laws and acts, both by the UNICEF and even by the governments of our countries for children, don't we? But even then, children worldwide suffer insidious forms of violence, abuse, and exploitation. Yes, in the history of human rights, the rights of children are the most ratified. There are many ways in which ch child rights are violated. Child trafficking is one of them. Some of us are privileged here because we may think that child trafficking does not exist in the 21st century, but for the rest, it isn't the same. In the case of India, Rural children are more vulnerable to trafficking than children in the urban and suburban areas. They are separated from their families, though promised good educational opportunities. Instead, they are sold and harbored within and outside of the country. Though trafficking affects children from all genders, girls especially are subjected to child marriage. They are married off to much older men and sent off to alien places where they are physically, mentally, and sexually exploited. Migration is another, but no new issue here. For years, children have been the victims of the migration crisis. One in every five migrants in India is a child. And during this process, they face devastating changes from separation to being injured or killed during armed conflicts. Most of their lives are shattered. Home is a safe haven for most of us, isn't it? But for some, it isn't. 
domestic violence is another one of the ruthless things that happen to children. Violence at home leaves everlasting impacts on the mental health of children. children. Children from such households suffer from PTSD even as they grow into adults, which proves that the mental health of children has never actually been a priority for the world. And we all might know that children are used as soldiers by some countries. Terrorists use them as suicide bombers for labor. And the saddest thing here is that parents willingly give away their children to such scenarios. But, and as always, children remain the unaware victims. These are just slices of what happens in the ruthless world of child rights violation. But we have laws, is what some might respond. Yes, we have laws, but they're also easily violated. Uh, one one second, one second. Dr. Wasavi, can you mute yourself, please? If I carry on. Yeah, thank you. So, but we have laws, is what some might respond to these. Yes, we have laws, but they're also easily violated because of the innocence and vulnerability of children. But what we are forgetting here is that these children will be leading the future. We will be leading the future. And they have always been good imitators of what they see. Stacia Tosher says, children, we, we forget that children are, I'm so sorry. We worry about what children will become in the future, yet we forget that they are someone today. These lines are an eye-opening jerk to reality. Here's a very hypothetical question. Why don't we treat them as valid, rightful individuals today? Because this one step might change the course of the future. Thank you so much. Wow, Ifat, thank you so much for touching a very, very delicate topic. And I know not everyone would want to talk about it, but you did. Hats off to you. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely, this. lovely, Ifat. It's like, uh, you know, she's really got into in-depth uh, into child rights and protection and she's really put up real valid points. I thank all the speakers who have spoken so far and it's been a really huge learning experience and I congratulate all the young speakers, Henry, Anveshan and Ifat who has so far, you know, given us a lot of insight into their lives as children and what they, you know, um, as responsible citizens, they can uh, definitely do add a lot to this world, you know, when they grow but from now onwards till they are grown ups. So that's so lovely. And uh, yes, Simran, over to you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasavi. And I do agree with you. We invite our next speaker for the day, uh, Kusum Kanwar. She's National Co Committee member for EPAR, uh, founder and CEO at Up Skills, MD Kanguru Kids Kandivali former principal, Bilagbong High International School, Malad and Santa Cruz. Over to you, Kusum. Thank you. A very good morning to all of you. And I could just go on listening to Ifat, you know, the whole day. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so thank you, Sphere of Influence. And, um, you know, thank you, ECDF and uh, Ms. Vasavi for creating such beautiful platforms for all of us every time. So that's one of the reasons I, I just love coming here beautiful beautiful topics and i think it's it's like you know i'm, I'm going to talk about wonder filled early childhood environment which encapsulates or you know it's it's everything that everyone spoke here so beautifully so i would just like to add in my two bits where i say that learning doesn't have to be complicated to be meaningful so we're creating wonderful wonderful uh you know wonder filled early childhood environment and it has its side benefits you know, fostering wonder in the environment brings and enhances creativity around children, makes teaching more rewarding and fun and gives uh, children a jest for, um, you know, imagining and learning to, a last, uh, to last them a lifetime. We adults have fundamentally changed the experience of childhood in such a way that impairs a wonder-filled childhood. How? By eliminating the wonder from the experiences. You know, a simple example of toys and entertainment. And I loved what Abigail also, uh, you know, spoke about. And, um, and that we introduced to our children. You know, we feed children an endless stream of prefabricated characters. We give them images, props, and plots. And these actually allow children to put, you know, the imaginations to rest, not to enhance it or fill it with wonder. You know, fill a child's environment with wonder where children can imagine a stick 
is a sword in a game or story that they've imagined. Can they play Star Wars with a specific light? Link wonder to creativity. And just this morning, you know, like uh, Ms. Abigail also showed a box, uh, a cardboard box. You know, a kindergartner in my school showed a cardboard box turned into an artful painting with such happiness. And the whole online class was lit up in amazement and wonder and was so colorful. There was animated discussion around it, bringing smiles and grins, you know, to all parents and teachers alike. So you have probably seen such pictures and instances of something that made you think, what a great environment. You know, for example, something that I always think of is uh, a photograph of a little baby lying inside a hula hoop, reaching for the many colorful ribbons and fabric swatches tied to the hoop. Can you imagine the simple part of an environment shift used today for this child and at a later stage for another child? So to inspire, play and creating wonder-filled environments, let's curate spaces with open-ended materials that kindle children's engagement with their surroundings. So what kind of spaces, you would ask? We can do some design thinking and rearrange home corners and use the kitchen, the balconies, you know, and um, by just, uh, and our terraces, uh, you know, by, and not just our living rooms, just by dividing your homes into zones is a wonder filled game changer for children. Example, create a library area using throw cushions, low seating, and storybooks at a height which could be easily reached by children. A cooperative zone, you know, where the child chooses to paint, he draws, writes, and sets up storytelling. And every time children change their setting and their physiology, it stimulates and energizes their brains. Create a wonder around storytelling. Dress up, dance, picture books, math equations, songs. Creating a wonder around your balconies and gardens teach them seed germination. Children are explorers. Growing their own microgreens gives them a unique sense of achievement. It's nurturing, laying the seeds of innovation, creativity, wonder, appreciating life and growth. And they will eat it too. Take them on a bear hunt. They go looking for a place to picnic with the picnic baskets, carrying the bear cutouts that they've just painted. This experience is filled with wonder and excitement for them. What have we created through this one activity? The developmental skills, sense of balance, you know, body awareness, the spatial awareness, language skills, cognitive abilities, and by simply creating a wonderful, wonder-filled environment, I would say. Create wonder by practicing visualization through story yoga. It's just a magical experience for children when they're a part of the story becoming different animals and animal poses with yoga. So these simple shifts in the environment by adults, that's by us, brings wonder and magic to the learning. It develops empathy, cultivates imagination, divergent thinking and developing critical thinking skills. So that's the magic behind a wonder filled environment. Thank you so much for giving me this platform. I really enjoyed and loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us for on wonderful in environment. That's the nice concept. Thank you so much, Kasum. And thanks a lot for your time this morning. And now I move on to our next speaker, uh, Grishma Momaya, head of Trio Thoughts Parenting and Education Expert global goodwill ambassador for India, education ambassador at 100.org from Finland and UK, India Star Icon Awardee, certified educator from UNESCO, UNICEF, Microsoft. Thank Over to you, you for, Thank you for short and sweet introduction. Uh, hi everyone, what a wonderful, wonderful morning, listening to such amazing leaders and speakers. So uh, my topic is, you know, social and emotional well-being of, of children. So since we have three minutes, what I have done is I have 
uh, put across three C's of social and emotional engagement and its impact on children's learning. We all know that classroom and house are our ha homes are, are an emotional place for children where they have where, where they experience different kinds of emotions because they take pride in their achievements, they hope for success, they feel scared, you know, uh, when they are not able to do some activity. Now, in our classroom or in our homes, how can we make sure that the social and emotional well being of children are taken care of? So the first C is compassion. Raising a compassion child is no small feat these days, which means we as educators and parents have to put in a lot of efforts to raise a compassionate kid. Now, what can we do, you know, to make sure that we are raising a compassion child? First one is to teach them self-care, okay? As adults, even we sometimes, you know, ignore uh, and do not take care of ourselves, but self-care should be the first thing that we teach our children at home or at school. Second is show them that you care, okay? It's so important for us to, you know, to, to just show our children that we care, we are there for you, we care for you. And next is each day is a clean slate. Forgiveness is critical in, in you know, while, while raising children, because if a child feels as though that they are constantly reminded of their past errors, they will feel that they are being permanently labeled as a bad child. So when we forgive our children at home or at school for making mistakes, is connection. The key to teaching children social and emotional skills is creating a classroom, connection built on community. Strong communities have members who have shared goals and experiences, who feel empowered to contribute, who trust in one another. What happened to the Balato and the Thimusan? Understood. Everybody go on. One second. One second, uh, Grishma. Can everybody go on mute, please? Matri, send on uh, Grishma. Grishma, can you please go on mute? Thank you. Grishma, sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. And who trust one another, who feel understood and capable as individuals. Now, how we can do that in our classroom or at home? Focus on trust and relationships so important a relationship between a teacher and child is so important we all know we all are teachers we all were teachers one day then second i feel the most important thing is to co-create rules of our of the house of or of our classroom with children most of the time we adults take take decision and you know create make rules of our house of our classroom but why don't we create rules co-create with them so that Children also take accountability of their behavior. And always do not under, underestimate children. Give them a say. Okay, allow them to express their thoughts. And the last C that I have put down and I feel is so important is culture. Introducing children to various cultures, whether we are in India, we are in abroad, wherever we are. But it is so important for us to you know, introduce children to culture. And the first step in helping children feel positive about racial and cultural identity, identity is, you know, reflecting diversity in your surroundings. What we can do as adults uh, is add toys and materials that reflect the cultures of children and, you know, families of your classroom. And we should remove materials and visuals that promote stereotypes. We can also introduce culture through music and dance. We all know that children thrive on music. Why don't we introduce children to different, you know, music of, of various countries? They will have super fun. And next, we can also celebrate all festivals. Even if we are, we have a school in India, why don't we introduce children to festivals that are celebrated around the world and, you know, getting them used to or getting them to understand the culture of our, of the whole globe. 
So I feel I chose this topic because from an educational perspective, emotions are important because of the influence of its, its influence on learning and development. But students' well-being should also be regarded as an educational goal that is important in itself. Academics will always follow. Children will learn better if they are happy and if they are in a good mental well-being. So I end my uh, topic here and thank you everyone for listening to me so patiently and thank you ECDF for having me here today. Have a nice day. Thank you so much, uh, Grishma, for your insightful talk this morning. Thanks a lot for your time and explaining us so uh, wonderfully and in depth. Thank you very, very much. And now I welcome our next speaker, Dr. Geeta Shukla. Dr. Geeta Shukla is an educator, a critical thinker, change catalyst and a problem solver, solver who has specialized in working with children, parents and teachers for over 37 years. She's a principal with Manav Bharti International School, Dehradun, child development specialist and mindful parenting coach, success psyche, parent coaching, child development specialist. Over to you, Dr. Geeta. Thank you, Simran. Thank you, ECD, for giving this platform for me to share my thoughts. As Ifat started on the same note, talking about the child rights, when I was listening to her, I was getting emotional also. Uh, she has been very, uh, you can say, impactful in what points she has brought. Uh, Ifat, you are a great speaker and thinker. Thank you for being with us. So talking about the child rights, I will take from IFAT and first I'm going to share with you the data census of 2011, what that says. And I'm pretty sure that is going to remind and it is going to be eye opener for all of us what is actually happening around in India because I'm focusing on the data from the India especially. 39% of the total population that is 472 million are children, according to 2011. 99 million dropped out of school. See the dropout rate so high. Only 2% of schools are offering education from post-graduation to 12. 10 to 13 million children are child laborers between the age group of five to 18. 150 child, uh, children per day go missing. Such a serious concern, either because of kidnapping, for sex trade, for organ trade, for labor trade, they are just missing, no clue about them. Crime against children has increased times within the five years of 2011 census. And now we are talking in 2020. One, suicide rate among children are the second largest and the reason there's failure in their examination. Situation is really alarming. 19.8 million children's, children are undernourished. 9.6% of children don't get enough sufficient food when they are between six to 23 months of age. 38% have a stunted growth. One in every three, three child in the world is a child bride and that is from India. So this is the current situation uh, from the data which is available. Why is it so? The reason for this is basically our empathetic nature. We, we just do not empathetic nature. We are not even thinking about the children which are around us. For us, if it is my child, my own child, family, children from my family, then they are children. What about others? We just don't bother about them. It, we always say it is their parents' responsibility. We always say it is the responsibility of government. As a result, what happens to my next door? I am tended to ignore that. 
I am not putting any focus on to what is happening to my uh, child next door. Similarly, a child in my class, I will be taking care of that. But what about child in the next section? If there is no sexual abuse case in my school, I'm happy with that. But if that happens in another school, it becomes another school's responsibility, not mine responsibility. In addition to this, when I was thinking, uh, listening to all of you people uh, regarding the uh, addition of culture, uh, book reading habits, we don't even think that these are the rights for the children. So now I'm coming to mention few rights of the children and elaborate just a bit, just a bit. Right to survival does not only mean the life. Giving birth is not the only child, uh, right of the child. It is health, it is nutrition, it is name, it is nationality. All these also comes under the right of survival. Right to development doesn't only mean giving education, getting admission in the schools. It means schools need to provide them the environment for sports, for recreation, for cultural activities, everything. And that is the right to development. When we talk about right to protection, it is not only from exploitation, sexual abuse and neglect. It is the right to be respected, just not slapping the children around in the schools, in the houses, in the homes, which is happening because parents are not even aware that this is their ch child's right for protection. You cannot hit your child, whether whatever you are, whatever the wrong child might have done. There is nothing wrong as such, and you just don't have any right to hit your child. Right to participation. We don't give our children right to select our books, to select our clothes, any choices we are not providing them. Forget about to select about their religion. We consider that they are very small. So religion, they can't say anything about it. But we need to, simple, very simple thing. Every child has a right to be happy. And if a child is happy having a pet around home, why as an adult, we are not giving that opportunity for, to the child to have that pet because we don't like it. And another important point is that we are not, we are literate, we are highly educated, but we are not educated for child's right. So most of the time we consider that child is the responsibility of the parents. So parents can have right, but not the children have right. Same way in schools, teachers have right, management has right, principals have right, but not the children. So what happens if a child brings out some issue and then the child is targeted more rather than taking care of that child. We target, start targeting the child. We say the child is vocal. As a result, children, they get harassed, they get sexually abused within the families by their biological father, fathers also, but they are not getting any place to vocal their, uh, to tell them to get uh, some empathy, to get some uh, compassion from the people around them. So, if I, I'm really sorry to say this, that as an adult, we are failing our children. With such huge adult population, we are not at all taking care of our children. And that is really, really, really sad. How can this picture be changed? By being careful, by being empathetic. Above all, please, please, to everyone who is listening, learn, learn to know, be uh, proactive to know about child rights. Yes, there are specific laws regarding uh, children. Parul, there are many laws. Constitution has given rights. Article 39, E and F, Article 45, Article 21A, Article 24, these are child specific laws. And then <coughs> children also have the rights given to adults. That is with mentioned in Article 14, 15, 21, 23, 29, 46, and 47. These are also the rights of children, though they are given to the adults. So I won't say that law is providing us the um, 
platform where the children's need can be addressed it is just that the older people are not aware of these laws and we uh, keep on sh shifting the responsibility to the people around us because this takes a lot of our time if we start focusing on them indian constitution started in 1890 1890 1890 since then till 2020 continuously amendments in the laws have been made to make them much uh, uh, to make them more effective and to give children more peace and thank you so much uh, for listening to me my purpose will be solved if we if at least 10 or 15 of us start looking more in the child rights learn more be aware more of our surrounding be conscious as a teacher as a parent as an adult as as a human being children are individual entity and they require to be treated like an individual thank you everyone for listening to me thank you ecd for giving this platform thank you dr geeta and you have given us a lot to think about uh, a very very thought provoking um, and meaningful and insightful uh, dialogue from you this morning thank you very much i really appreciate your time and uh, the kind of effort you have made to make sure that we are aware of all of these things which we usually are not thank you so much once again and now i welcome our another young voice aryaman sharma project support specialist at gleeson lemon group former trainee at the the langham hong kong culinary arts graduate ihm aurangabad member of akanksha foundation an ngo for educating underprivileged children counseling psychology enthusiast over to you uh, hello everyone and uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and I must say it is indeed uh, such a privilege to be a part of uh, this event. And uh, honestly, uh, as I have been listening to all of you, it has indeed been such a learning experience for me to get such valuable insights from all of you. So thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'll be basically talking about uh, the use of technology for the betterment of uh, education delivery. Uh, basically because this topic is kind of really close to me because uh, the technology has indeed played a major role uh, for enhancing my learning during the course of my education. Uh, so as we know, uh, in, in the last few decades, uh, the development of technology has uh, indeed impacted so many different aspects of our life. And uh, it has indeed, uh, you know, brought about a lot of changes in the education pattern that is prevalent in the in this current uh, you know generation as well uh, so we can say that technology and uh, education is kind of interconnected and this interconnection has uh, brought about a lot of uh, you know it has given rise to a lot of new possibilities so let us look at a few of these new possibilities uh, so number one, according to me, would be uh, creating a global platform. So there are so many different educational institutes uh, that is not just stuck to one, uh, one way of providing education or just one platform of providing education. So now these institutes, they provide the learning through this online platform. And this is accessible to uh, the students uh, from all over the world, like globally. And this is so important because this exchange of information between the teacher and between the students can take place from any part of the world and at any time. So that's number one. And number two would be the instant access to information. So in the initial time, you know, like for example, my parents, they if if they wanted to if they wanted to do a project or they wanted to learn something. Uh, or they wanted to inquire in information about something, you know, they had to uh, probably visit the library or they had to depend on a professional to get that learning. But now for us, because we have this, uh, this boon of technology in this current era, so we can, all this information is available to us just at the, you know, click of a button. And this entire manner of we uh, gaining this, this insightful information 
you know it's so much more effective as it saves so much of time so much of valuable time then the third would be the smart classes and the smart learning that uh, you know basically smart classes are technologically advanced classes so the learning here takes place through uh, you know powerpoint presentations through projectors and the use of a lot of uh, you know multimedia and personally from my own experience this form of learning has really really helped me to understand such important concepts in a deeper and a more uh, in a more functional level and uh, it has i believe it's more of an interactive form of a learning and uh, it is it is more engaging and at the same time it's more entertaining and this form or this kind of a learning is indeed more beneficial according to me because it helps a student uh, you know go about its learning in a more holistic manner and uh, then would be uh, the the addressing the students diversity so you know each and every student they have their own different way of learning every student might not learn in the same manner uh, when exposed to a traditional classroom kind of a learning so uh, the technology has brought about different modules uh, which can help these students uh, who learns in different manner uh, to uh, un- to learn and understand all of these educational you know subjects um, as per their own learning uh, capabilities and lastly and the most important according to me is the role technology has played uh, in the field of education during this covid-19 pandemic so we could see that uh, uh, you know this this uh, this entire covid-19 pandemic brought this entire world into onto a standstill but uh, all the students uh, you know the, the entire education system however it still went on and this was only possible because of technology all the learning or all the classes that kept on happening in the online forum so this was something you know which is indeed which is indeed a boon to all us all to the entire humanity so i would like to conclude by saying that yes indeed technology has played a, a major role in the in the betterment of education delivery and my message to everyone would be that that we as individuals we make the mo- the maximum use of um of this facility of technology that we have and we not only empower ourselves but we also empower others and spread this information and you know make the most of what this facility is to us so thank you so much have a wonderful day and thank you thanks a lot and yes this indeed has been an insightful time and technology has become more of our uh, ally and more of our support system thanks a lot for speaking to us uh, this morning and giving us your time and uh, you you spoke so flawlessly super very well done thank you so much thanks a lot and this is a wrap for the 10 to 12 slot speakers and we thank you all so much for being here stay back with us because the event has just started and we are going to hear all the esteemed speakers throughout the day throughout Uh, the evening and we will see who all are uh, presenting as uh, young voices too so this is me simran balani saying once again thank you so 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 much for being part and now i take pleasure in